Dr. Mary Lou Jepson is no stranger to big ideas and to starting things up to make those ideas a reality. In 2005, she and her colleague Nicholas Negroponte at the MIT Media Lab joined forces on an idea called One Laptop Per Child that aimed to produce a full-featured laptop for $100 that could be made accessible to children in developing countries, $100. She was the chief architect of a rugged, low-cost, low-power, fully connected laptop that is now in the hands of more than three million children. And the program has proven to be good at transferring the necessary local knowledge to make it sustainable after all that work is done. Her skill as an innovator has been on display, literally, for many years. As an undergraduate at MIT, she built the world's first holographic imaging system. She was director of engineering at Google's Google X division and a key executive at Facebook's virtual reality group. 100 is an important number for Mary Lou in other ways besides the $100 laptop. She's on Time Magazine's list of the 100 most influential people, and her name is on 100 patents and counting. Today she's turning that expertise and her deep uh, technical and innovative knowledge of imaging to the medical field, and as you'll hear tonight, her new company, Open Water, is seeking to pioneer technology that would shrink the massive MRI device to something you can wear for just a few hundred dollars. It would make continuous real-time medical imaging a present-day reality, and if the moonshot part of this idea that goes along with it proves possible, it could also enable communication by telepathy. So we're going to talk about all of that tonight and more. Please join me in welcoming inventor, professor, startup founder, and imaging pioneer, Dr. Mary Lou Jepson. Wow. Hello. Nice to, nice to be here. So great to have you here. What an intro. Thank you. Welcome. It's so great to see some familiar faces in the audience. Wow. You have a lot of friends here tonight, which is, uh, which is terrific. I want to talk about... Um, You've been an innovator your whole life, uh, and I just scratched the surface. So where does all that creativity come from? I think all kids are creative. I think we, we beat it out of them. I mean, I don't know. I, I wasn't into blocks and Lego. I was into like spirograph and math and optical illusions and stuff like that. And I just kept going with that. Yeah. yeah. Spirograph. Wow, I haven't heard anybody talk about a spirograph. <laughs> That's a great toy. Forever. That was a great toy. Uh, it definitely was. Um, so you were innately drawn to that kind of visual way of thinking about the world. Was there somebody who was influential early on for you? Anyone that you remember who made you spark that? Well, I mean, I grew up in a farm, so I learned how to fix things because we had to. We didn't have much money. And on the side, my dad had a business rebuilding car engines, so I'd help out and... Uh, figure stuff out. I wasn't that good at figuring it out. I just saw the process of how he could figure it out. And it gave me confidence to realize, you know, actually every lab I've been in subsequently is not that different than that auto shop where you just, most of the time you're trying to find the right tool or make the right tool. So kind of tinkering and playing and, and yeah. doing all those things. Yeah. Uh, holography. Talk about what inspired you to Think about that as a pursuit and how you created this holographic system so early in your career. Ah, did anyone see the first Star Wars? <laughs> R2-D2 projected out Princess Leia and I thought, wow, and that was special effects. But yeah. May the fourth be, may the fourth be. So yes, I mean, I, um, when I started college, I made a deal with my parents. I wanted to be an English major and they said, you can go to the local school if you want to be an English major. And I um, agreed to major in electrical engineering as long as they'd help me pay for college. <laughs> so I had to be a double E major. And the, you only get one elective. And there was this elective in holography. And I thought, wow, that would be really cool. So I took this holography course. I didn't like the electrical engineering at all. I mean, I kind of hated it. But I fell in love. It was the closest thing to a religious experience I ever had, the magic of making it and this thing coming out that was a hologram that was 3D and like, wow, I made that. But what did I do? How does that work? And I wanted to understand deeply the electromagnetics of it, the optics of it, the physics of it, the chemistry of it, the human visual system and, and the computer graphics and all the stuff that you, I took deep dives in after Before that. Before you built that, 
was this class, this one elective on holography, just theoretical? Or were you just talking about the theory oh, of holography? Oh, I made the world's first holographic video system. Holography uh, won the Nobel Prize in like 1971, Nobel Prize in Physics. So the first people that made really the first holograms were, were in the 60s. So I was taking a class on how to make a hologram and uh, got really hooked on it and really wanted to understand a lot about it. So I'm, the thing that I did as a, as a grad student at the Media Lab, maybe my, my first really big innovation in holography was uh, the first, with a team of graduate students, it was a team effort for sure, um, we made the world's first fully computer generated holographic video system where we simulated the physics of the holography process in the computer and made a display where the pixels were this, approximately the size of the wavelength of light. So like today for HDTV, that's like 2,000 by 1,000 pixels. We had 25,000 pixels per inch in this thing. And I made that screen by hand so that I could show the wave nature of light in the screen so we could make the hologram work. You made it by hand. Well, is that how it had to happen? I mean, there was no screen available to I you built unless it you built it in the lab. Yeah, so it, sure, of course. My hand. I mean, my hands were in there, but it was. I mean, I could explain to you how it works, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, it, actually, I found out when I when I made it and I started giving talks about it. Somebody asked me, "Do you know about scofany?" I didn't know about scofany. Have you ever heard of scofany? 1922. <laughs> The acousto-optic effect had just been discovered, and somebody made a projection system using essentially the same layout, not with the small pixels, but the engineering was almost the same. So I went to the MIT library, and they didn't have any of the 1920s work, and so they, I went into this warehouse and sat there for, I think, a month and read TV and shortwave world, <laughs> everything in the 20s and 30s, and I was just blown away by what people had done with so little in the mechanical TV sets and then was able to refine and make a, a better system with the modern day things that I had access to in the 80s at that time. This was the 80s when I was doing this. So I got really into history. That's why it's a thrill to be at the Computer History Museum. I was going to say, you know how, how my heart is just beating <laughs> so much faster now that you're talking about you going all TV? the way back to history. And, uh, Shortwave World too. Well, we were talking about this earlier and you do, th th this seems to be a pattern throughout the way that you think about the future. You go back into the past and you really talk about first principles and look at the fundamentals. Why have you found that to be so important? Uh, you can see different things if you go, if you, you, we stand on the shoulders of giants, so why not look at what the giants did? Plus, they're so interesting to learn about. I think there's one side of looking at the work that they did and understanding, someone was quoting backstage about Shannon's Law and a misinterpretation about Shannon's Law, where the basics of where Shannon is you know, a god, and so if it violates Shannon's Law. But like, if you actually look at what they wrote, it's not as black and white. And then also hearing learning about the circumstances in which they did it, I, every time I feel like I have something to whinge about, I look at one of the, I, I think we were talking backstage, I read another biography of a great scientist, and I think, I got nothing to complain about at all. And uh, I find that is also really helpful too, as we walk through whatever trials and tribulations we have to walk through. I mean, Fourier, I read about this year, and I read a biography, he was um, an orphan and his parents died and he was put in the orphanage slash military academy to become cannon fodder for the Napoleon's mm. incessant wars. And uh, then the storming of the Bastille happened. He almost got guillotined, he got out of that, but then he fell in line. He, he loved math and science, but he couldn't do it. He had to go be a soldier. And then, you know, he, uh, just an astonishing story about how he finally got to do math and science at about age 50 and invented Fourier transforms and Fourier series. and discover the greenhouse effect. I mean, astonishing mm. that he had to walk through, you know, a great deal of pain. And there's a lot more, but I'll spare you. <laughs> anyway. And imaging is, has been such a passion of yours for so long. What is it about all the things that you could have pursued in math and science and technology? Why imaging? Why was that the thing that has just had, held such fascination? 70% of our minds are allocated to processing visual information. It's, it's how we think about the world. It's, it's, um, I loved math and art growing up. It combined them in an interesting way. 
I mean, for me, it's like really interesting to do, like as, as a kid, a really technically hard problem, like, like um, math, and, and then find the solution as a visual reward. And I think also, there's this, I was interested in art and science, and a lot of people think that you can't do both. But you can, and in fact, each informs the other. And I think actually if more scientists and technologists did more art, we'd have a lot more creativity, like STEAM, not STEM, where the science, technology, engineering, and math is the STEM acronym. If you add in art, we could get a lot more, a lot faster, a lot more innovation. And I, I bought into that because I loved making things. And I love, even if, it were, well, even if they weren't that great, a lot of the studies say now if you make art, even if it's not that great, it helps you in, um, in, in your creative process. Yeah. So I find that, too, to be the case. And was it a natural thing? You've sometimes, practitioners like, like this who have such success in universities, especially as undergrads, decide to just pursue that. Just stay at the university, right. teach, do work. You have not done that. You've chosen to actually get out and work in the private sector, do startups. Right. Why, why choose that? And especially why startups to Google, to Facebook, to startups? What's the pattern there if there is one? I just try to use my skills to make the best change in the world that I can, that I feel capable of with the ideas and the opportunities I can find to be available. I never intended to go to grad school. I fell in love with holography. Nicholas had started the Media Lab. They got this guy, Steve Benton, this amazing holographer there. I applied, I got in, and I got sucked into grad school. Who knew I would like it? But then there was no PhD program in it, so I had to become entrepreneurial because I loved holography. I felt like I would die if I, I mean, Madonna says this about music, and I don't know whether you like your music. I'm not actually a big Madonna, I'm not really a Madonna fan at all, but she says, like, musicians, you don't do music because you want to. You do it because you're gonna die if you don't do it. And like, otherwise, why would you go to all that effort? No matter what musician you hear, like, they work really hard to sound like however they sound. Um, I just felt like I was gonna die if I didn't do holography, so I tried to find a way to fund it. And there was really no funding for it. So I had to become entrepreneurial and convince potential bosses that had some budget to find a little bit of money here or there. I lived on less than minimum wage all through my 20s and moved to, I think I moved to Australia and then Germany, Japan, all over the place to sort of scrounge together from fellowship to fellowship some funding to do interesting things in, in holography. Mm. Let's talk about what you're, what you're, it wasn't popular. Yeah, now people pay me a ton of money to do it because there's no talent because, well, it was really hard to yeah. get talent. Well, that's, that's terrific. I want to, I want to jump now into your current idea, right. which is, um, I, I read somewhere it was described sort of as a mashup of, uh, of MRI and telepathy and this, it's, I mean, it's a really big idea and I want to sort of unpack it for everyone so that they can really understand what the central idea is and then how you're carrying it out. So can you just get started and then we'll have a conversation about it. I was trying, I've been trying to, you know, we have these big dreams. I was trying to figure out how to do telepathy since I was a kid and who knew? <laughs> it's funny as I was remarking on talking, I had no idea that I'd end up here talking to you about a telepathic system, you know, at this age. But yeah, I figured out how to do it, um, mostly because I wanted to figure out how to do it. I became really fascinated with uh, how the mind worked because for a personal reason, I, I had, I had non-elected brain surgery. I was gonna die unless I had brain surgery. I had a brain tumor removed in my 20s. And that, as a side, so um, neuroscience became a side project as a means of self-preservation subsequently, and I learned a lot about it. And I kept thinking, you know, looking at the systems that we have, how can I figure out a way to, first I was thinking of radiating brain tumors and communicating with thought. Like, I've just been noodling on the problem for decades, wondering how to do it. And the truth is, there is a system that's been available for 10 years now that does do this, that enables us to communicate with thought, to be able to at least read your thoughts. If I threw any one of you right now in an MRI machine, hi Fred, <laughs> I could tell you what images you were thinking of, what words you're about to say, 
whether you're paying attention or not, whether you're in love or not, and on and on and on. We can do that today with a multi-million dollar MRI scanner. And so when I saw that about five, six years ago, I thought, wow, we just have to figure out how to up the resolution and lower, the, lower this down. Maybe I can use some of my consumer electronics know-how to, to help this happen because it seems so fundamental. I nearly died because an MRI of my brain was too expensive and I, I suffered for many years. Many people suffer from, from that. So I was interested in both telepathy, enabling the moonshot being communicating with thought alone I think in images. I would love to be able to just dump my images directly to the computer. I don't, that's why do I like, why do I like displays? I think in images. And the images like, you're thinking about. I don't just, think in language, yeah. I don't, yeah. as people do, but I don't. I think very visually and it would be great. And I know musicians who think, you know, in layers of sound and it's so hard to get the layers of sound out of their head. How, can we do this? It sounds nuts. So, but I'm comfortable with people thinking I'm working on something impossible or I'm stark raving. And, you know, as a woman in technology, like two things are true. I'm underestimated, but I'm remembered because I look different. And so I learned that if I say crazy stuff, <laughs> people remember that. And then when I do the crazy stuff, they're like, whoa, I thought she was nuts. She got that done. And then they bet on you the next time. So like, you're not bet, when you say this stuff, you're betting on the next time. But like, actually, at this point, I really can do it. That's so we had, I diverge. I diverge. <laughs> no, so, no, that was um, great. <laughs> so the thing is, how did you do it? How do you do it? And so, you know, a few years ago, about five years ago, I saw this system from Washington University in St. Louis, and they were using optics to match the resolution of functional magnetic resonance imaging, using the principle that your body is basically, it's opaque to visible light. That's what we can see. But if you shine near infrared light on it and you've put on night vision goggles to let you see near infrared light, you will all look ghost-like. They'll look like milk or lemonade, somewhere in between, and scatter, you'd scatter the light. And so using um, time of flight imaging, they were able to match the resolution of fMRI to one inch or one inch and a half down into the skull and be able to pull words and images out of people's heads. Now explain. FMRI, because that may not be a term everybody's oh, sorry. familiar with. Functional magnetic resonance imaging. So those are like the big tubes in hospital you lie in if you tear your ACL or if you've got a big headache or you, they think you have a tumor and you hear all these pingings. That's, that's um, MRI or FMRI. It's actually the same machine in different modes. Well, that's exactly what we think of. We think of these big machines that you lay inside of and every MRI, as you said, you, right. you almost died because you couldn't afford to have an MRI. And right. It's thousands and thousands of dollars to do this. It seems so distant and unreachable as a, as a technology for us to think about right. wearing and having it be personal and then be the basis of this. It's a big, huge magnet, it right? Is. It's a big, huge magnet, and it's really, it's getting 10% better every seven years. They cost mil millions of dollars. If you look at the, their, their profit centers for the hospital, the $50 billion of revenue, uh, per year in the U.S. alone for MRI scans, 30 million scans per year. It's, it's, a, it's a cash cow. So like, it's really expensive, and yet like, we don't even use it for di diagnosing most diseases. We know MRI is a better diagnostic from breast cancer, and we don't use it not just in the U.S., but in any country in the world. We're, we're not thought to have the most efficient healthcare system in the U.S as is well publicized. Um, and you've been a big consumer of it. We, we don't <laughs> as, need to go into as, that, but as, you've had your so, encounters with it. But in any country in the world. And so we, people are dying. Like, why, why do we have to, can't we just figure out? And so for years I tried to sort of thought, maybe it's not bigger magnets, maybe it's better magnets. And I worked with these things called squids. And then I saw this paper from Wash U, and I thought, Wow, and it was this big fiber optic wig with these like refrigerator size amplifiers and decoders of the s signal, and they were only getting an inch down. But I thought, wow, this is amazing. This is optics. That's what my PhD is in. This is my thing. Like maybe I could help. These guys are pretty good, but they, they're not really consumer electronics experts. Have you looked at this system? You're like it's clear. Like they're not. They, they, I've visited them and I've become friends with them. They're they're really not. Like they haven't shipped billions of dollars worth of product and the carriage of physics. So I thought maybe I could figure something out that could make that system a lot better. Mm -hmm. 
And it turns out that I have. And we don't need to do the time of flight stuff. We don't need the refrigerators. We can fit it into a ski hat or a bandage, something at higher resolution than MRI that enables us to communicate with thought, detect tumors, see if you've got internal bleeding, see if you have a clogged artery, see if your tumor is shrinking or growing. Monitor your body. Like the same way you can buy a blood pressure cuff at the, the, the drugstore, why can't you buy a system that can, can monitor your body and, and tell you what's going on, how the changes are? So quite apart from the telepathic part of this, this is going to have, if you're successful, you're, this is going to have enormous medical benefits just as a device to do what MRI does today. Right. The number one healthcare expenditure in the world is brain disease, the billion people that are, are completely disabled and cannot work because they have either debilitating mental disease or neurodegenerative disease. The therapies haven't changed for them in 30 years, but a portable system that can neurologically monitor and allow d directed therapy. So this, this system can read and write, deliver light to certain parts to reactivate or, or with drugs signal different things, or just to monitor neurological activity to see if you've got a blood clot, to see if an epileptic seizure is coming on. And, on and on, there's, there's a ton of possibilities that massively lower the cost of, of healthcare and enable us to communicate with thought and let's both. Let's stay, before we go both, let's, let's stay with MRI for just one, right. one more minute if we can. Um, sure. Anyone who's had an MRI or has seen the image would know it's a pretty fantastic image and in, at high resolution, it really is very amazing. What is the image that your very small technology, very inexpensive technology produces? Right now, we're at 100 times the resolution and the center of your brain at four inches using essentially LCDs and detectors that are made in the factories that make your smartphone, using the, the trillion dollar manufacturing supply chain of Asia. So that can enable a cost cost down, sorry, I'm speaking Chinese English, um, a, a lowering the cost, not 10%, not 10x, but 1,000x. So rather than a multi-million dollar system, you could buy something with higher resolution than MRI for less than the cost of your smartphone, which means an MRI scan for less than the cost of a phone call. So that can be transformative to healthcare. I met a guy from Tencent, the Chinese um, company, who said they did this whole study in the developing world in clinics throughout Africa, Latin America, the US has also developing world clinics, and went around, did a survey, asked the people running the hospitals if you could wave a magic wand and you could get one piece of equipment, what would that piece of equipment do and how would it change the healthcare you're able to deliver? And the number one thing on that list was a portable MRI. It was, it was shocking to me. I didn't know that until mm. Tencent told me that. Um, but it could be quite transformed because they don't have electricity. These things cost a million dollars a year to maintain, and you need helium. And just the, like the whole, the whole out, outfit of, of it is it's amazing. It was such a breakthrough when it, when it came out. So I mean, it's, I, I'm here because of MRI. Yeah. It's, just, it's too expensive. The reason healthcare has gotten more expensive is because we have better technology, and the technology has made it more expensive. And so as technologists working on healthcare, I think it's part of our job to try to massively lower the cost, like we did in the $100 laptop. Yeah. And it's got its own power on board. It can, it can it, it, how does it send the image out so that you can actually see it, read it, well, print it, whatever it is that you have yeah, to do Yeah, I mean, so, the, the pro, so we're having these micron-sized pixels in, in the smartphones. Well, I mean, smartphones, you can't buy micron-sized pixels now, but I know a thing or two about layout. And we're making the screens, just so you know. I think this is the first, and I always ask, and in an audience like this, maybe somebody can tell me if it's true or not, the first time somebody's made a screen, not for the eyes. So I'm making a screen that lines fabric on the inside of a ski hat. So how does it work? It basically, I mean, I can explain the physics of it, but like on the output, you can, you can basically you can see, if you want to see an MRI, an fMRI image, for example, you look at oxygen consumption. We can measure oxygen consumption uh, uh, 
pixel or really voxel is a 3D pixel. We measure it voxel by voxel through your head, which is exactly what functional magnetic resonance imaging does. But we're at the point where we think we can get neurons themselves with our imaging system. And, and for me to explain how the imaging, I need to explain how the imaging system. So the data, we use AI, big data analytics, the tools of our time, really. Consumer electronics, big data, and AI enable us to look at what's happening in your body and image a tumor, image a blood clot, or image a clogged artery, or neurological flow of, 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 of anything. Mm. And um, that happens um, because basically we can, I don't know if you want to know if the, how it all works. I actually think it would be good <laughs> if you can explain it in, in easily understandable terms because it's such amazing technology and it's just, it's fitting right on your head. It's, right. it's, it's inside the, a hat band, uh, essentially, the way you described it. And I think it would be interesting to actually describe how that imaging works yeah. of the human brain. So this whole field was proven, and we were talking backstage, it was proven to be totally impossible in 1999. So <laughs> it's totally impossible. Luckily, it was proven to be impossible. Yeah. There was a the paper whole written. use of diffuse imaging, it, scattering, imaging through scattering, because we're using this near-infrared light, as I mentioned, and it was proven to be mathematically impossible in 1999. But in about 2009, somebody proved, oh, that was wrong. <laughs> game back on for diffuse optical tomography or diffuse imaging. So how does this work? It's a whole different rethink of it. It uses basically a principle that's been known, if you go back to the, the beginning, back to the first holograms, to the first holographer, um, figured this out, that you can make a hologram through uh, a scattering medium. And this, in this case, that's your body. You can make a hologram of a scattering medium and invert it, and by inverting it, it, if we think holography uses the wave nature of light and, and light's a wave, as we discussed, um, if I drop a rock in the middle of a pool and the ripples radiate outwards, that's also, you can think of that, visualize that as an optical wave, even though it's a pool wave. If I took some transducers on the side of the pool and shook them at just the right way, I could make the ripple pattern go in reverse. That's what phase conjugation is. And now you're all experts on the math. I think of math really visually. I spare do the equations. But that's what we do. That's a 1D, if you will, or 2D field. That's what we do in 3D. If I dropped a million rocks in the pool, we could reconstruct that ripple pattern. And that's what holography does, is it records these ripple patterns of, of the wavelength of light. Like the wavelength of the ripples, that's the peak to peak. Like you've got these peaks and troughs in, in, in waves and in ripples. You also have that in light. It's just a lot smaller. It's a hundredth of the width of a, of a hair, that wavelength. But you record that and uh, invert that, which is sort of like, this is a techie audience, so I can say like, you know, if it's seven eighths pi that hits the pixel, you compute nine eighths pi. It's a really simple computation. You can do it in the screen itself. And, and so what you can do is then basically make your body effectively transparent to the light. So to the light, through the hologram, your body becomes transparent and you can look, the scattering goes away, and you can look at the blood flow, you can look at the tumors, you can look at, you can look at the different other features then in high resolution using literally an LCD that was made in the factory that makes the screen in your cell phone, which costs about 30 bucks. Ours will be more expensive first because they're custom and you know it's a couple million dollars for the mass set and you know, but like really, um, it's completely doable and we're, we can image the whole body that way. And, and using that and the principles of, of functional magnetic resonance imaging and looking at oxygen flow, we can image the words you're about, the words you're gonna say, the images in your head, the thoughts in your head. And so the yep. reason I'm talking about this so publicly is like, this is really, we have to define what it means to be responsible in, in unfolding this. And I can't separate the telepathy part from the medical part. Yeah. If that, I could, I would, but I can't. That's, it's the same technology. That's what I think is so fascinating about this, uh, because you, 
you can't, you see it as one continuous process. It's, it's right. the telepathy occurs as the result of this science that you're doing, this image, the science of imaging on right. the brain. Uh, now, so let's talk about that for a minute. How is it that the imaging tells us what you're about to say, the colors that you're seeing, the words you're thinking, the music in your head? How does all that work through the imaging process? So... Um, for about a decade, people in neuroscience have shown, did I already, I'm sorry, I feel like broken record. Um, uh, if, I, if I throw you in an MRI machine, I can tell you what words you're going to say. As I mentioned, there's been a lot of studies to show, to, that prove this. And for example, we were talking backstage about a professor at, at UC Berkeley, Jack Gallant, who um, ran a study in his lab, and, and they threw three graduate students in MRI machines for hundreds of hours. Hundreds of hours. And made them watch YouTube videos. I hope they got a great <laughs> stipend or something. <laughs> I don't some. know how much they got paid. Right now, they're doing it with moth, um, the moth um, uh, storytelling series yes. from, I think, NPR. Um, and, and, but this was YouTube videos. And they made fMRI recordings of, of the grad student's brain reacting to YouTube videos. So they had a library of, of, of reactions for each student and created a dic dictionary, a visual dictionary, using big data analytics, AI, and brain scan data. And what does the brain look like when it's reacting? Well, they just looked at what fMRI measures is oxygen use. What part of your brain in 10 cubic millimeter voxels is using oxygen? And based on that and pattern matching, it could predict when a new image sequence was shown what the student was watching, even though the computer didn't get to see the new video, just using the data store. It was a low resolution grainy image of Steve Martin walking across stage and the plane landing and on and on, but it was close and I saw that and I'm like, whoa, we just need to up the resolution and lower the cost to be able to do this for real. It could change everything, it could change everything. Like, it's fun, understanding how our mind works is fundamental. It's, it's who we are, it's we're human. And like understanding the brain and being able to communicate at a higher baud rate. I mean, we're all kind of Stephen Hawking in the low baud bandwidth out of our brain in that we can just move our mouths for talking or type with our fingers or draw or write. But there's a lot more going on in your head that we could dump out. We could, human creativity could be explosive, right? It's just... Speed will, everything now will seem slow. It's sort of like, it used to be 100 years ago, it took three weeks to cross the Atlantic Ocean. Now we can do so in, well, if the Concord was still around three hours. But you know, we can go around the world super fast. And we think of everything as going so fast, but I think in a decade when we have this at scale, we'll look back and we can just think something and it can appear. You can skip the whole, like, getting the image out of your head and the idea out of your head. I can make my devices work. We leverage the robots, the 3D printers, and all these things that are going to take our job. But we're more creative. We still have 100 billion neurons, each with 100,000 different connections. We're by far the most complex computer ever made that we have any idea how to make. And we're really good, I think, because the synapses are a bit unpredictable, yeah. and so we can create. Well, there's a creativity aspect, and there's a privacy aspect, which I want to get to in a second. And, and then there's just the question of, do we want to know everything that's coming out of everyone's brain all the time, which is kind of another aspect to this. And we should think about that for yeah, a minute. But of uh, before we do that, I want to ask you about um, the computational power that is required for this. And, and whether what you're talking about is kind of achieving the dream science fiction has been talking about for decades, which is reverse engineering the brain and really understanding how the brain works and being able to, if not replicate it, at least just broadcast it. Is that, right. is that what we're talking about? I think that's what we're talking about. There's a lot of good work being done in the neuroscience community. And to quote um, Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft, there's five Nobel Prizes just to understand how a neuron works. So you could say, how are you going to do telepathy because we don't even understand how a neuron works? And it's like, you know, you can still send an email and not understand how a transistor works. Maybe that's not a good analogy, but like the point is, measuring oxygen flow alone, we can do this. We're hitting neurons. We can measure neuro neuronal activity 
non-invasively. And so there's this whole group that says, oh, it's unknowable, you can't ever know it. Like, I can tell you what images you're thinking of. I can, you can dump your dreams directly to video right now using a $3 million fMRI machine. So there's the people saying it's impossible, and then there's the people that are doing it already. So this is, it's interesting because there's so much effort around the brain. There's so many people doing it. I think we're doing a top-down approach. There's the Allen Institute's definitely a bottom-up. Paul Allen is like that. You know, he's fantastic. I think he's amazing. There's people coming at this from all different angles. You have the national academies of most developed countries saying of the top five things a technologist can do right now, somewhere on that top five list is reverse engineering the brain. And so, yes, I mean, the point is, what happens when we achieve that? We think we can do it much, I mean, we should be able to hit, hit millions of people in the first five years and hundreds of millions of people within a decade with the technology I'm proposing. And the, the resolution is going to go up because we can use the manufacturing infrastructure of Asia that's very good at making the feature sizes we need for this. Where are you now? in perfecting this technology and getting it ready for use? So we've given ourselves the first year to explore the bounding box of the physics. How deep we can we go? How fast can we go? What resolution? So what scanning speed? What depth? What resolution? How reliably can we get, can we get neurons and other features? Should we just go for blood or oxygen or what? clogged arteries first, what should be the first product. We're trying to figure out where the limits of the technology are. And where are you in that first We year? haven't found any limits yet. Oh, so we're a couple, we st I, I left the Facebook officially at the end of December. It was supposed to be August. But, you know, building up the team um, now. So I'm really focused on team, prototypes, and IP. And just a few months into it. I mean, I guess I've been on it a year. The teams, I've started hiring last fall, so it's, it's, it's scaling up. But, um, you know, uh, it's not about the number of people. It's funny, one laptop per child, everybody said, how many people did you have? It was only two people the whole first year. I think we met with 100 heads of state. Kofi Annan unveiled my prototype, and we signed up the largest manufacturers in the world. Like, it's not the number of people. Like, I guess we're trying to find the limits of the technology right now to, and the artifacts imposed when you really print the various, um, the various devices. Because when you shine, there's theory versus practice, and then there's this back and forth we're doing with a series of different architectures, kind of like a, a contest between them. And then we make a Franken architecture because we try to take the best mm -hmm. of each. And so we're doing a lot more experiment because once you go into the big fabs of Asia, they're not R&D facilities. You better ship really quick. And so mm -hmm. the only time we have for experimentation when you do hardware like this, using fabs that, that don't take any external designs. I mean, I've worked in fabs where I'm the only, I guess, Apple now, but they kind of buy the fab. There's no real example of it. These are the manufacturers. These are the people who make the devices. And, and well, they, they're, the, they're the, 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 the huge multi-billion dollar, $10 billion um, liquid crystal display fabs or OLED fabs in Asia that basically change the diagonal in the number of pixels and don't take external designs, don't Right. make any changes, don't, don't say no. I mean, I went from... They just do what you tell them to do. No, I've heard, I used to hear no 99 f times for every 100 questions. I've reduced that to 90 times, which is actually a 10x improvement. Yeah, that's, that is. But, like, I've been able to ship billions of dollars worth of product and make money for these companies. Nobody else has done that. Like, literally nobody else. Right. It's really shocking. Like, it's like, cause not, it's either, it's like, you, know, you can't get a holography degree, you can't get a display degree. Like, in the entire US, there's never been either. So, um, there's just not a lot of talent. So, you know, you, if, if you just do get, fall in love with different things and get really good at it, you can have a lot of influence if you also, learn some basic diplomatic skills. So you've <laughs> got eat a lot. <laughs> you've got this first year, you're giving yourself to, to draw the boundaries yeah. you said, and then then what? What what comes after that? And we decide what the product is and we ship the product, the first okay. product. So we're not sure what the first product should be, and a lot of it will have to do with what depth, resolution, cost structure we decide. We'll probably go with some first early access partners like 
every so many hospitals and so many entities that want to work with us to and that's the first market hospitals we don't know maybe you don't know it's, maybe it's to go directly to telepathy we haven't we're not we're purposely not deciding it's weird i also purposely didn't drive up and down sand hill road i didn't make a pitch deck i didn't i broke all the rules on this i just started talking about it and the billionaires came to me and i just rule number one i try not to get billionaires in technology mad at me but it's, you know, it, it's sort of heady stuff. It's my fourth startup. I felt like I could not follow the rules, but no, I don't have the product pitch deck and we're gonna make this amount of money at this time. Like, no, we're, like, when you're doing something that's a thousand times lower cost, that has the potential to transform humanity in this way, you really don't worry about the product roadmap. Like, there's a ton of products. We just have to decide which one to go first and why based on the limits of the physics, what's easy to do, what's hard to do, should we go for a reach goal or not, but we need to found, understand the bounding box of the physics. We're starting to collect question cards from the audience, and I want to make sure that your questions get asked. Um, I'm going to ask you two things before we do that. First of all, let's just stay with this startup notion for a minute. Um, you're a few months into this. Many startups are still in what is commonly known as stealth mode. Nobody wants anyone to know about a company, especially one that's as potentially revolutionary as this. And you don't believe in stealth mode. In fact, I even read you, you said that secrecy is not helpful, uh, just generally when you're doing something like this. Why do you have that approach? There's so few people that can help us. We want them to come beat our path to our door. When we, st when we did the $100 laptop, we started telling people we're going to make a $100 laptop. We heard, that's crazy, that'll never work. Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Michael Dell, Craig Barrett, the then chairman of Intel, not the Google executive, all just said it's crazy, it's never going to work. And so then we got the crazy people of the world to be the path to our door to help us make it happen. So that was pretty interesting. They also helped us debug it. And uh, that was pretty interesting and heady experience. In, in the case of this one, the main reason to talk about it is to try to define what it means to be responsible because I can't separate the physics of the medical imaging from the physics of the telepathy. And so it's funny, this um, literally a rock star, friend of mine who's now a human rights activist, Peter Gabriel, he called me every week for six months trying to convince me to quit Facebook, to take this technology out and do it as a startup so I could be more open about talking about it because we needed to define the ethical and respect. He thought it was going to happen. We're not going to be able to hold it back. But how do we get in front of it? And how do we help all of the technologists working on technologies, biotech, CRISPR, Cas9, um, all the different things that are happening, yeah. optogenetics, figure out how to bring these forth in the world in the most responsible way that we can. Because the, the potential for misuse is strong unless we can engineer a system around the, um, the big threats. Yeah. And so how do we do that? And I think the pragmatic thing is to teach people how to lie or tell mistruths into the system, but that might not be ethical to lie. And so what do we do? What's the right thing? Well, we should have a dialogue with ethicists all over the world and lots of different groups. The days of a committee of ethicists sitting behind us doors to decide what's ethical or not are over. Our notions of what is appropriate for privacy are changing every year right now, and there's no way to do it, according to the ethicists, who I've spent a lot of time talking to. They mostly ask questions. They're really you know, Socratic. The ethicists. <laughs> the ethicists are mostly Socratic. They ask questions. And uh, you know we're changing a lot right now, and they feel a, a public dialogue is necessary, not just in Silicon Valley and Boston, but globally. I'm interested, we unfold this. I'm interested to hear you talk about all the people who can help and that you need them to come in and help. And the ethicists are one. Where are the neuroscientists in all of this? Are they on your side? Are they not on your side? Are they helping, not helping? What's going on with yeah. the experts in the brain? The, the experts in the brain are interested in better tools, but a lot of them are, have never been exposed to this way of thinking and think they should have had it in their PhD program. I'm <laughs> like, well, you know, at that point in time, diffuse optical tomography was proved to be mathematical and mathematically impossible, which is why you never had it in your PhD program. But, you know, the notion of, because I'm a neuroscientist, I know all about consumer electronics and optics and everything in the world is also false. But I'm amazed at what the neuroscientists have done, which is why I've joined the field. 
I'm dazzled by what they've done using functional magnetic resonance imaging. People like Jack Gallant, and there's other, there's, I won't list all of them, but 20 years ago, some students, some classmates of mine went into brain mapping. I, I really thought it was like modern day phrenology and they were wasting their career and I, I was nice. I didn't put it like that. I'm being more provocative now. And looking sort of 20 years later at what they've done, I guess that was now 30 years, um, I'm dazzled. I'm really dazzled and I thought it was time to pick up and help them. You're dazzled at how close they were 30 years ago. Oh, sorry, when they went into it, uh, I thought, how do you map the brain? It's uh. too complicated. How do you figure out how it works? A bit in Paul Allen, I was so complicated. Why are they? And then I look at what has been accomplished in some aspects of the field, and I thought, I think they're, they've done amazing jobs. They need people to make, we need to make better tools to be able to see in higher resolution through the system. And I believe it has to be non-invasive, and that's controversial for neuroscientists, but there's two reasons it has to be non-invasive. Elective brain surgery is a non-starter. Do I need to explain more? I mean, <laughs> I've had brain surgery. It was the hardest thing I did in my life. So, and number two is, as we think about privacy, you know, my cell phone is off. It's actually literally off. I did that to be on stage with you. But apparently, people can still listen in. Unless, if I can take the battery out of this one. I've got an old one. I won't do that right now. However, what happens if you've got an implant? Can people listen in? What if you want to really have some private thoughts? Can you just take it off and remove it? I think th those two things are fundamental to make a technology that can scale. Mm. And I just think, you know, the needle probes, when you put a needle through all of those neurons, you're killing all the neurons as you get to the one you want to read. You also have to open up the skull. It, it's, it's a lot. <laughs> So I don't know why people think that's the way to go. I don't know how you get to hundreds of millions of people that way in a voluntary way. I think um, the, the idea of putting silicon nanoparticles in the bloodstream, the thing, as far as I know, Elon's doing, it's sketchy, smart guy, clearly very effective, done amazing things. Wow, it's cool he's entering, but the me first method he's talked about, when your capillaries are two microns in width, even your red blood cells are, are larger. They're seven microns. They squish down to go through the two microns. And they can't even squish down right when you have some diseases like malaria. They stiffen, and so that's why you get brain damage uh. in malaria. So if you're putting in pieces of silicon in two micron, like, aren't you? It's a leading cause of death in the world, clogged arteries that cause strokes. And we're putting solid particles in vain. Like, it, there's. I think it'll take a while to get FDA approval. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I think of Elon, I think, why is he doing it? What is he thinking? And this is where I get to. He hasn't said this. He wants to go to Mars. He wants to go light years away. Our bodies aren't strong enough. So do we need to become cyborgs to enable us to go light years away? And is uh. that because your brain won't last light years in space? Is that, I mean, it's a question. I That's him. a great I hypothesis. I saw him at a party That's... a few weeks ago, but I didn't know he was doing this, so I, next time I'll ask him. Uh, one other quick question, and we've, I've got a fistful of questions from the audience here. Um, speaking of recent entrants, you're, you're talking about Elon Musk. At the, at, at the Facebook Developers Conference, mm -hmm. something similar to this was discussed, uh, and that, that got a lot of attention. Sure. Are you surprised? Is it similar to what you're talking about or, or different? Can you talk a little bit about it in th I think that context? They've announced they're doing the old Wash U, so the five-year-old Washington University system. So that's the time of flight, billion frame per second camera that needs to be water-cooled and is limited to just a couple millimeters of depth in your head. And so I have no question the physics are going to work. They've been working for five years at Washington University. Um, They've announced that they're, I think they're trying to do, you know, I think the reason people are announcing before they're showing the demos is to try to be responsible in this, in this area. I think Regina Dugan, the, the former head of DARPA, who's, who's head of that program, announced that, you know, that they're planning to, what they're doing ethically about this and how they're going to, and so they're getting in front of that. So I think it's pretty exciting of all the entrants. Ours is already 100 times higher resolution, 100 times more depth 
100 times higher resolution, so that's already 10,000 times better than the goal for their system. So we're not, you know, we welcome them, like, great, you're coming too. <laughs> cool. This is a great question. If you and I were wearing these devices tonight, would we be communicating telepathically? I think we'll all start to do that. I mean, won't we like swim our minds, let our minds out and swim around with each other and the computers? It'll be like, I mean, here's the thing is it, if we don't turn on the filters, it might be like being at Burning Man all the time, you know? <laughs> and like, so do we get like the sex and violence filters and turn them on or like what you had for dinner? Like, well, all the things that you think of, like how do you focus and can, you know? And then all of the biases, you know, there's right. incredible things. The, the human frail, like can you imagine having to run human resources at any company? <laughs> if people, if you could really see what people were thinking in a meeting, like, we have all this politeness. And so like, how do we learn how to um, transcend that and learn how to deal with the fact that we hear little lies all the time it's for social lubrication and deal with things really openly and honestly and expose ourselves. We might have to take lessons to become comfortable <laughs> in revealing ourselves. So it's a big step. Well, and if we're communicating telepathically, what does that mean for the radio audience? We should think about that a little bit. Next time we, we think about our friends at, at KQED. Um, why do, this is obviously someone who is in the life sciences. In fact, it says, why do tech companies think they can do med tech better than life sciences professionals? Why don't they hire us experienced life science pros? We're hiring life science people that have been working in, in imaging using near-infrared. Yeah. So we have those on and the it's, team. And it's not necessarily better, is it? I mean, you're trying to knit together a lot of people with a lot of different expertise to solve a problem. Really multidisciplinary background. We're hiring, I mean, I just, so thrilled. I just got this guy. He's just, he's been designing really cool holographic systems for like 30 years. Craig Newswanger. He's like a legend in holography. And, Oh my gosh, I mean, one of the things, he's, he's done a lot of art holography. And you could say that's not important until you look at the history, just specifically in holography. The scientists made these awful looking display holograms. And then you look at Craig's holograms. Really low signal to noise ratio because that's what artists actually do because they care what the image looks like. But in terms of diversity, I mean, we've got lots of different people. We're hiring people from life sciences, but what we're making our display chips and <laughs> cameras and um, holograms. So to do that, we need people that have made displays and holograms and worked with near-infrared light. And those are the types of people we're hiring. And then AI people and artists. We're hiring artists because uh, I believe that's important. There's so many questions here about privacy. And, and you, you touched on it uh, a minute ago and the work you're doing with ethicists. But where do, you, where do you come down on this? What do you think, where do you think the boundaries will be drawn or redrawn in the area of privacy if telepathy actually becomes a reality? I think different people will set their own filters. The concern is any government. People think other countries, but our country could do this too. The police or military making you wear a hat or a little ski hat, I propose or maybe worse, your parents making you wear it when you come in at three in the morning on a Friday night and want to know where you were. And, you know, should that be allowed? What is that? And so I think where I go to is we either have, we have to teach people how to foil the system or in, enable a true consensual use in, in the system, our system, we can, I can even say our system will only work consensually. My fear is once the technology is out of, out of the bag, people can copy the physics and make one that can work non-consensually. That's why I'm worried about this because when you use the fabs of Asia, you're letting it out there. It took three years to copy an iPhone. How many years is it gonna to take to copy this technology? Five years? if you put enough people on it. And so that's great, because we will get cost down, yield up. <laughs> the four words that describe a lot of the Asian manufacturing infrastructure. So this can be very low cost. But if we're not controlling that consensual aspect of it, how do we make it so that 
people can be that switch, so it can only work if they wish it to work. And so that's, that's the thing that keeps me up not, at night, the responsible way to, to do that. That's where I go to. Mm. But we're engaging in a dialogue with lots of different organizations on this. Not an internal organization behind closed doors, but many openly out there from lots of different countries, lots of different cultures and backgrounds to see where they go. But that's my fear is even though we can commit for consensual, what do we do about people that copy the technology? And so it's... What do you do to protect your own intellectual property? File patents. And then we talk about it because we think it's important to make it happen and we think it's important to make it happen responsibly. And so it's sort of... Peter Gabriel calls it this Oppenheimer cocktail that the technologists sort of pioneering this of exuberance and you know this this fear of, of misuse and how do we address it? I read a lot of Oppenheimer like great like Oppenheimer was one of the creators of nuclear technology and it you know was really tortured about the effect of the, the nuclear bombs on on killing so many people and so what do we do as we march forward to try to be more responsible in creating the technology? We talk about it, for one, and so we file the patents, and once we file, we actually start talking about it. But the patent office... Has that happened already, that people have seen your patents and they're starting to say, well, our, this is... Our patents have, certainly have to talk about this. Our patents have been approved to issue, but actually the moment we filed them, we started talking about yes. them, even before they were approved. And they may not have been approved, but they were, so... Do you do that informally? Do you have a, a forum? Do you convene people where you get together? I mean, you, you're out there, you're, at, you're here tonight, so that obviously is starting a dialogue already. Yeah, we're thrilled to talk, especially at the Computer History Museum. We think people haven't faced, have faced this problem before. Yeah. And what can we learn from the good ways that, that people have dealt with it? And what are ideas for, for marching through this? Mm. So there's the people who believe, oh, it'll never happen. If, if we fail, like, fine, who cares? But even if you don't believe anything I'm saying, when, if you think you have to, you know, like it's going to happen. And what do we do about it when it happens? And, and how do we deal with the consensual and non-consensual nature of this? I mean, Jerry Yang was tortured when he released the emails 20 years ago for a Yahoo customer to the Chinese government. And then it turned out they were Chinese dissidents and they were jailed in an awful jail. He felt very tortured. None of us knew that that was going to happen. That was the first sort of thing in my radar where that happened. And so then they made protective provisions around that to make sure government couldn't get email of, you know. But how do we avoid those things? Certainly there's been a lot in the march for online for digital and privacy and our discussion of privacy, but this ups that by an order of magnitude or more. Like it's just, it's a whole different level of privacy. Well, and I want to go back to something you said just a second ago, which is this is going to happen. For a lot of us in this audience tonight, this is the very first we've heard about an $800 MRI device that's going to allow you to communicate telepathically. And the woman who's inventing it is now saying this is definitely going to happen. It's inevitable. The physics is solid. The engineering is solid. There's nothing stark raving mad about this at all. So we need to get ready for this. The Facebook system looks... I can tell you the physics of that is solid. Elon, I don't know, he's, it's Elon. He does amazing. <laughs> Are you going to bet against Elon Musk? I mean, come on. Um, and then, you know, there's other companies, too, that are entering the fray. And so we stand on the shoulders of, by the way, this has been going on in the universities for decades. There's astonishing neuroscientists and physicists and people that have brought us to this point. And in each approach, you can... The, the physics seems incredibly mm. solid. This is the thing that we enable is low cost. I, we haven't guaranteed eight hundred dollars. We don't know the cost of the first structure. We have to cover the development cost. But at scale, there is no reason it has to cost more than a smartphone because we're using the subcomponents, actually less subcomponents than are in your smartphone yeah. at volume. I, I should I should say but that was that was my price. number because it's the yeah, cost of a smartphone the, today. Today, so and yeah. that will continue. So it should be right lower by the time we hit volume. It's all based on volume in in the manifest. So we're the ones that are bringing the consumer electronics supply chain in this, so that it can scale to millions of people very quickly. There are a couple of questions here about the about medical conditions that could be detected 
right. by this kind of science. And one, one of them, which came in over Facebook Live, is blood glucose levels being measured non-invasively. Is that possible? There's been a lot of work on that. I, I got, I, when I was at Google, I got to hang out with the now called Verily, Google Life Sciences people. And there was a lot of work on that. We haven't looked into glucose um, much yet at open water. Blood is such a large signal in the red, in the infrared, because blood is red. <laughs> and it's even infrared, so it's like really easy to measure. It's a huge signal. We're, we're excited about neurons. People have asked us about um, myelin, myelin sheaths, and that looks easy because of the polarization properties. We're looking at, at other things. We haven't tried glucose. Mm. But certainly there's been a lot of effort on non-invasive glucose in research groups I'm aware of. And what I about? I can't say much more, but um, we could look at it. What about conditions like depression? Is yeah. that detectable? Yeah. In fact, I had the head of a very large European country's mental health institutes, plural, say the moment we have this fee hat, he's issuing it to every patient with clinical depression in the entire country. And that's because I learned from him um, Clinical depression, a lot of people kill themselves. A million people kill themselves every year globally. A lot of them with mental disease, 90% of them with mental disease, a lot of those with clinical depression. People don't kill themselves at rock bottom in clinical depression. They kill themselves as they're coming out of it, often in a nonlinear, erratic way due to the therapy. If the doctor can measure neurologically what's happening, we can keep the clinically depressed patient safe so they recover. And so that, that's what the Mental Health Institute people tell me. Um, and there's a host of other diseases that enable communication and therapy. We can keep neurons alive longer by applying infrared light. That's FDA approved. Now we can focus it. So people with Alzheimer's, we, appear, we can clear amyloid plaques with infrared light. We're using infrared light focused. Amyloid plaques are related to, to um, Alzheimer's. And so there's an enormous amount of work being done in brain science and neuroscience and all the, you know, brain disease and all the subclasses of it. And they are lacking tools, a tool that we can deliver to them that can do things that haven't been possible before. This is always possible. Well, that could tools. be a great outcome of, of this. Yeah, and it's the number one, as I mentioned before, the number one health expenditure in the world is brain disease, because it takes so long to cure and it's so expensive, people live with it for a long time. They tend to not, it takes a long time to die of neurological disease and mental disease incapacitates so many people. Every family has it, every family has it. And we are stuck in not being able to do much to help those people. And so just even a wearable system with a resolution of an MRI. Like if you're clinically depressed, sure, we could throw you in an MRI machine for three months and monitor your clinical depression. But it's unlikely you're going to come out of it laying in the MRI machine for three months, right? Because it's somewhat depressing, right? It's just... <laughs> so if you could walk around with it, it would be way better. Are there any physical consequences? This is one of the audience questions. Physical consequences or side effects of using this device? We're talking about benign near-infrared light at light levels lower than walking outside here in Mountain View on, a, on an afternoon like today when the sun was out. So much lower levels, more like a cloudy day. And so there are none known. It's far below the, radi the radiation, the light levels allowed. It's close to visible light. It's benign. But, you know, we're going to check that everything's safe. It's all approved at these levels already by the many people that have already created um, near-infrared systems. When you go in the hospital and you put one of those clips on your finger that measures your blood oxygen level, you look at it like, that's infrared light looking at the color change of your blood, whether it has oxygen on it or not. Those are widely used, um, for example. Right. Here's a, a personal question that goes back to something you said earlier, which is uh, you said you're usually 
underestimated as yeah. a woman. Has that affected your life and work for, for, for good or not so good? Well, you just try to leverage whatever you can. When you realize people don't think you can do it, like this idea that girls can't do whatever, like they're getting all the A's. Like I was doing calculus in junior high school. Like I, I was the smartest kid in the room. Like I really was. Um, I hope no one from my high school's watching. <laughs> like, no, they were smart too. Sorry. On one measure of measuring it, I think there's many levers. So underestimating. I mean, you go in, you look different. Yeah, they don't think you can do it. And so you just, you do it anyway. You just, just find a way. The stuff I liked was also super hard to find. So that, that, that took a lot. So um, I think that's just the nature of being other. And so you need to find a way through it. But by being other, you can see things they can't see. Whether it's other because I like optics or holography and in a, in a sort of valley where CS is a sim, computer science is a synonym for STEM, and anybody from science, technology, physics, engineering, and so forth, or math isn't really, you know, it's sort of pretty easy to be other, which means you're going to be able to figure out different things. No one's going to listen to you or pay attention, but, you know, when you're working in a company like Google or Facebook, you can still get millions of dollars to prototype it, so it's okay. It's pretty cool, actually. Those are the audience questions, and I'm going to ask two final ones now. You mentioned earlier this STEAM notion and the need to think, or how much fun you found it to be to stand at this intersection of technology and art. Are we, are we hanging on to that concept today in education? Are we in danger of losing that concept? Where, where do you think we are from a, from a policy and just a practical standpoint about the way people are being trained to think these days. Yeah, it's this notion of training, right? Like, how do you let kids explore and do the things that grab them because they can learn about it? It seems more expensive, and yet, is it more expensive or, or not? I mean, otherwise, like, we have kids dropping out of math and science and engineering at, at pretty early stages, and, and yet it's pretty fun, and they would love it. And, you know, you go, I was at this art school. It was interesting to go from, like, go back and forth. And in art, there's a lot of women, and in science, there's a lot of guys. And in fact, like, it's not that different from where I sit. So, how are we educating? Um, it, it, I just was at a meeting where the new Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, was. And I don't really understand her policies, but um, I'm hoping that uh, how do we leverage the kids themselves? That's what we kept thinking at one laptop per child. Can we make the kids the Trojan horse of whatever educational system we throw them in so they can become creative to dig their way out of it? But like that that's pretty sounds pretty strong and negative, but it's just what are we, I, I don't think, I, I don't think we're doing a great job, and yet the flip side of it is, is we do get all the smart people from the world, we do have places like Silicon Valley, the Computer History Museum, something's working right, so great, but like a certain percent of people it's working for, but the vast majority of people it's not, and so then we have people making decisions that can't even understand the most basic concepts of science and statistics and so forth, which is quite um, problematic. Sobering. I think. Limiting, limiting. And limiting. Given the scientific mm -hmm. method seems, you know, to be pretty well established now. So, yeah, I mean, these are these are the the problems. And so, how do you get how do you get around them? How do we work on the the I mean, it's really, the U.S. is really hard. I worked in education with one laptop per child. We have more school districts in the United States than the entire rest of the world combined. It's usually centrally done by in the Ministry of Education with a few people from the ministry, some of the great intellectuals of the country, and um, some of the top school teachers, and they figure out what the curriculum is. But I'd love to quote Alan Kay. I mean, I was, I remember being with him. He helped us start One Laptop Per Child. And we were in Tunisia, 
at a world, uh, a UN summit on the digital divide. And we went to see this ruins he knows about because Alan's sort of an expert on everything. Computer history museum fellow, inventor of the Dyna book, um, many, many things, and Scratch, and a lot of different, maybe didn't do Scratch, Squeak, something, Squeak, Squeak. Um, and he was looking and he, he pointed down on the road to this kind of rut in the road and he said, I'll buy dinner for anybody who can tell me what this is called. And we were absolutely exhausted from running this thing in Tunisia where Kofi Annan unveiled my hand soldered prototype and I hadn't slept more than two hours and it felt like a month. I'm like, oh, Alan, I have no idea. Nobody took his bait. And he finally just said, it's a curriculum. It's the rut in the Roman road. That's the curriculum. We want people to follow this rut in a road. That's what everybody follows. I mean, they, we're not going to get creativity if we get everybody doing the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so how do we encourage people to go different ways? I didn't know a curriculum was a rut in a road. So did you? <laughs> and then finally, it, Open Water is your company. And if Open Water succeeds and, and this technology, these devices succeed, optimistically, if you look five, seven years down the road, what do you hope will happen if you bring this to market and it works the way that you think it, it should? We can massively reduce the cost of health care. That's what needs to happen. I mean, we're, we're hearing, uh, you know, like, it's just too expensive. We can't keep going in this direction, certainly in this country or in any country. So we have to work on that. The other thing I hope is we can amplify ourselves, understand ourselves. If we're scared of our thoughts, of whatever we're thinking about each other, I mean, it's still, like, it's fundamental to who we are. We have to sort of get over it and walk through it to, to sort of deal with ourselves or make ourselves into what we hope to be. If that, I mean, I hear that from people, like, you don't want to know what's going on in my head or my wife, you came, she can't know, and I'm like, what, you think about sex? Like, it's okay, like, it's like part of, of everything. And so there's a fear of it, and yet, if we don't understand ourselves, we're limiting what we can do. And it's not, by the way, we're not, I mean, this might sound nutty, but I just want to make an observation. We're not the only thing on the planet with brains. You know, there's all of these other animals that we might be able to communicate with and collaborate with. I mean, one of the outcomes is we might all become vegetarians as we start. I mean, I've stopped eating octopus because I like want to. It's del yeah, sorry, it was delicious, but I mean, there's they really cool. Um, you know, neurosystems, and they're really, like, it'd be really interesting to be able to communicate with an octopus, for example. Sounds nutty, but it's not that nutty. Does your dog really love you, or does it want to have food? You know, these are <laughs> important questions. Well, I, I can't wait to go home and ask my dog. That's, uh, that's, that's a great thought. Mary Lou Jepson, thank you for being here tonight. We're going to be looking on with interest. And thank you. We're so happy to have you here.